Coming up on tonight's episode of Faith versus Culture, Christian Storytelling. A good conversation with author Jerry Jenkins coming up next. That just depends on your definition of when life begins. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of Faith vs. Culture right here on the CBN News Channel. My name is Dan Andros. I'm managing editor of faithwire.com. And I'm joined as always by Billy Hallowell, also of CBN's Faithwire. Billy, how's it going? I'm doing well. I am. I'm excited because we are having one of my favorite authors on the show today. And I got to tell you, I don't think there's anybody around today that has had a bigger impact in the contemporary sense on Christian literature. We're going to be having on Jerry Jenkins in just a moment. And, you know, if you're not familiar, which I'm sure you are, Left Behind, that entire book series, um, he's had like over 200 books, but his most recent book is The Chosen Come and See. It's book two, uh, based, it's a novel based on The Chosen season two. So, Jerry, welcome to the show today. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. You know, I, I have a lot to ask you, but, you know, you have done a multitude of books, obviously, and it's insane to me when I look at the list of books that you've written and the impact that those books have had. What has it been like as a writer to be, you know, a person who has had such a profound impact on believers in their faith? Well, I feel blessed, and uh, I don't want to sound falsely modest, but I truly believe that I'm mono-gifted. I don't sing or dance or preach writing <laughs> what I do. And uh, ironically, I was never called to write. Um, I've, I've been a professional writer since I was 14. I was a sports writer for a local paper. Uh, string for them for covering high school games and that type of thing. So I've been getting paid for this my whole life. But at about age 16, I felt called to full-time Christian service. And I thought I was going to have to give up the sports writing and, and uh, you know, study to be a missionary or a pastor. And a counselor told me, she said, don't be too quick to give up the writing because it may be what you use as a vehicle to fulfill this call because God often equips us before he calls us. So that has changed my whole view of writing and success and everything. I obey simply by writing. And and what happens to the to what I write after that is out of my hands anyway. Mm. That's interesting. And you, you know, you talk about covering high school sports. And as a high school athlete myself, I appreciated you guys because I, I mean, you know, just seeing your name and stuff in the paper was just such a thrill. Um, so I always appreciated the local writers, but when you were like at that stage and maybe even a little bit after, did you anticipate ever having this kind of an impact the way that you've had? I really didn't. I, I thought I was, I thought the epitome for me as a sports writer, <clears throat> excuse me, would be to become sports editor of a big daily paper. And, uh, I was sports editor of a daily when I was about 19, but it wasn't a big city or anything. Um, and I still was feeling that call. And so I remember uh, just after Diana and I were married in, in 1971, um, I caught a glimpse of myself in the reflection of a window in a store. And back then we dressed up for work. So I was wearing a suit and tie and, and uh, <laughs> I was feeling old because I was an old married guy at 21, you know. And I thought I, it's time to answer that call. And so I started looking for work with uh, Christian publishers and wound up at Scripture Press editing a Sunday school paper um, I never thought, I mean, all, all I wanted to do was obey. Really, that was the, the bottom line and, and remains that to, to this day. When I started writing books a few years later, um, I realized I sort of found my niche. It was something that I had a knack for. And and because I, I was mono gifted, I felt like I need to, this is what I need to keep doing. Um, n never thought that, that I'd have the kind of success I have. And when you talk about the sports background, um, a lot of people don't know this because I'm so well known for Left Behind, basically, and, and now The Chosen. But a lot of my books have been best uh, have been uh, bestsellers about 
uh, superstar athletes, Hall of Famers. I mean, if, if I started listing the names, everybody would know them. They might not realize I wrote those books, but uh, that's really been been a, about a third of my career. You know, it's interesting that you you talked about sort of that mission, feeling called by God, thinking you were going to have to do you know something else, right? Whether that's being a missionary, or whatever it is, and then you get brought along on this journey. And, you know, you you wrote about sports stars and it sort of brought you to this place where Left Behind was going to be birthed. And I think a lot of people, they, they're familiar with Left Behind. They know the books and the movies that maybe were based on the books. But but how did Left Behind happen? I'm sure that's a big story, but just to throw that to you, because I think people would love to know. Yeah, I had written well over 100 books by the time this came to me. My agent called me one day and he asked me if I'd ever heard of Tim LaHaye. And I of course, had heard of Tim. Tim was a well-known speaker and, and nonfiction best-selling writer. And in fact, one of the magazines I had edited in the past, I had had uh, printed columns from Tim LaHaye, but I had never met him. And my agent said, well, he's an, a nonfiction writer with a great fiction idea, and you're a novelist with no ideas, so <laughs> let's get you guys together. <laughs> and we, we met, and, and Dr. LaHaye was the age of my parents. Uh, in fact, he was born within a few weeks of when my mother was born. So there was an immediate father-son connection there. I loved his idea. I had been telling the rapture story, the end of the world story, since I was a camp counselor as a teenager and uh, never thought I'd write about it. But he had this idea. He said, I write books about the, the end times, but I've never seen, uh, and, and, you know, everywhere I look, people are reading novels and I've, and I've never seen a novel on this. I think there had been a few, but they, they hadn't done much. And so he, you know, he said, can you write a, write a novel based on this? And that's, that's really where it came about. It was his idea. He didn't want to try to help write it. He was the theologian and scholar, of which I'm not. And uh, he kept me on track. And, and he was a great cheerleader. I would send him 100 or 200 pages at a time. And he would say, send me more. I want to find out what happens myself. So that's how that all came about. Hmm. Now, first of all, I just want to throw an aside here. The the amount of I don't want to just brush past the amount of books you've written. I've co-authored a couple books and helped write, like ghost write a little bit, and and it's insane that 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 number in my head because the amount of work it took just to get a couple of chapters of one book out. So right off the bat, I, I'm I'm just impressed with that with the sheer volume, and let alone the fact that they're quality. Um, but I, I just wanted to touch on. What you think of the state of Christian storytelling? There's a lot of conversation about Christians and and how they produce you know, movies and television and books and how they compare to culture at large. But what what's your take on all of that conversation? Well, it's an interesting conversation and it's important. And and the the idea of the number of books I've done, uh, my son Dallas teases me that he, he's pretty sure I've written more books now than I've ever read. <laughs> um, it could be the case, but um, you know, they're, they're, Christian writers are often um, criticized for being cliched or or old fashioned or out of touch, and um, I, I don't think that's true anymore. I think there's an awful lot of writers in in uh, my orbit who are writing gritty real life stuff and uh, and trying to tell the truth and and uh, do it in a way that engages readers. Um, my goal has always been to acknowledge where my readers are coming from. In fact, I think that's one of the successes of Left Behind was that, you know, you start with with a, a Christian minister's idea and a Christian writer's take on it. And it's about the rapture, the end of the world, Jesus coming to, to take people to heaven. And the, in the first chapter, this happens. And so the idea that this would cross over to the general market and become a New York Times bestseller, seven of those debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, I think the reason for that was that by the time that you finish the end of the first chapter, the believers are gone, the true believers. And so the people who are left are, can't be, you can't put Christian cliches in their mouths. They may be saying, this is what my wife was telling me about, or this is what I heard about one time, but they're saying it in their own language. And and I tried to infuse Left Behind with what I could call um, credible, skeptical characters. Not everybody becomes a believer. Not everybody's convinced. They say, if this is of God, why would he do this? Why all this chaos? And, and how does this make any sense? And that's where readers are. And we heard from so many readers who said, I, I saw myself in this book. 
I, and, and we even had atheists telling other atheists, uh, you can skip over the religious parts, you'll enjoy the story anyway. But many came to faith through that. That's great stuff there. We're going to be back with more on the other side of the break with author Jerry Jenkins. Right after this, this is Faith versus Culture. All right, we're back here on Faith versus Culture with author Jerry Jenkins. And Jerry, I just want you'd mentioned the sports stuff that you're lesser known for, but they still have had good success, those books. What are what are a couple of the ones that people might know but didn't realize that you did? Yeah, the very first one I did was uh, a book with Hank Aaron. And uh, he was right between home runs 713 and 714. The book was called Bad Henry. I think I was 23 at the time. Mm. I was so intimidated and so, so starstruck, I could hardly speak in his presence. I had to really get get comfortable with him. <laughs> but that led to a lot of, that was my fourth book. And I think I just finished my 206th or something like that. But that led to a lot of other uh, books. I did a book about Dick Mata, the coach of the Chicago Bulls, Pat Williams, the general manager of the, of the uh, Orlando Magic. And then um, I got to do one with Meadowlark Lemon, um, mm. Walter Payton, Mike Singletary, Nolan Ryan. Um, and so people would hear who I was writing the next book about, and they'd say, I'll, I'll be happy to carry your luggage if I can just. Come <laughs> you. But it's, it's been great fun. Amazing. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. You've had a diversity in your career with what you write about. And right now you're obviously in the chosen world. And I have to I have to say this because you mentioned your son, Dallas. You know, not only have you really in a lot of ways revolutionized the way that Christian storytelling has been done in books, but your son, Dallas, is revolutionizing the, the ways in which. Um, entertainment is happening and the ways in which even the funding of entertainment and the creation of entertainment through The Chosen, which has been a monumentally popular series. Uh, when it comes to this process of putting these books together, um, book two in this series, The Chosen, Come and See, that book is out. Um, before we get into the process, what do you want people to know about that book? Well, it's interesting that it's, it's sort of deconstructed. Um, a, a lot of TV shows and movies are based on books. Obviously, uh, The Chosen is based on the Bible, but these novels are based on the on the show. And um, so, I, I watch each episode at least twenty times. I'm never bored with one scene. I'm emotionally moved by every one of them, and and I try to to reproduce what's on the screen so that it isn't a isn't a juxtaposition. I don't like it when people you know, have seen something they really like, then they read the book and they go, this isn't how it happened. Mm -hmm. But I add a lot of inner dialogue, inner monologue, and, uh, you know, characters' reactions and their, their more, even more backstories, which is what Dallas is doing um, in the first place. They're, they're speculating on how did this thing that we know happened in scripture come about? Who are these people and, and uh, what got them to this point? So that's the fun part of this is is even adding more and and uh, giving added value. Well, and when you look at that process, you did this with the end times with Left Behind, right? And and now you're doing this with the Chosen, and you've done it with other books as well. How do you find that balance of creating characters, creating narrative, and especially with the Chosen, taking real people who we know existed in in scripture that we have, holding true to the scripture, but creating those new narratives and stories within it. Yeah, that's the challenge. And the, the overriding thing is you have to be a lover of Scripture and a believer in Scripture. I, I happen to believe the, the Scripture is the Word of God. And so I'm very careful with that. If I quote Jesus, uh, it's either something he said right out of Scripture or it it makes sense to be something he said. That's the thing. I had, I've had a lot of fun watching what Dallas and his uh, two co-writers do with the original scripts. Um, they believe Jesus had a sense of humor. And so when Jesus says something wry, like somebody says to Jesus, and this is something, it's, this is a little bit of a spoiler coming up in a, in a future episode, where one of the disciples beats another one in, in arm wrestling for the first time. And one of them says to Jesus, I can't believe he lost. And Jesus says, even I didn't see that coming. I think that's the kind of sense of humor he would have. And so it doesn't, <laughs> It doesn't besmirch him or, or do any uh, harm to what we know about Jesus. Um, he's loving. He's accessible. He's a friend. So many people are watching this series now and saying, I could follow a Jesus like that. 
the, the Jesus they've heard about or they think they know is, is so ethereal. And of course, he's perfect. We know that, but hard to identify with. And I think this makes that uh, makes him identifiable. Yeah, I mean, that is the interesting thing about The Chosen. I mean, it helps. Um, and, and it's a tough challenge. Anytime you're trying to bring a biblical story to light, there's always going to be people who criticize because, uh, I mean, you just you have to fill in blanks. It's just, just you, not every single moment is is written down. You've got to fill in some blanks. But I mean, from, for me, I mean, it's nice to just have a, a very well done representation of just what's happening in the Gospels. And so um, I think a lot of people resonate with that as well. And, uh, you know, again, we're talking about storytelling here. And I think doing it well, as Dallas and his team have, uh, I think I think it's super helpful for Christians. I think it is, too. And I, my joke to Dallas is that, you know, and he knows this, I, I've always thought everything he did was brilliant. Um, this time I was right. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good what dad. The, You're a good dad. Yeah. I, real quick, I just want to ask, what is you have your success, uh, you know, with Left Behind and all your other books. And now Dallas comes out. He's got the Chosen series here uh, at family gatherings. I mean, is it what about the guy who works at the office? I mean, like, is it is it a, is it a, what's the dynamic like there? I mean, it, It's incredible. Um, <laughs> it still stuns both of us that the, the same sort of lightning can strike the same family uh, in, in, in the spring span of about 25 years. I mean, the first Left Behind book came out 27 years ago next month, mm. and it's still selling to this day. It's, you know, it's, it is a phenomenon. Um, and people say, well, is the, is the Chosen going to be bigger? It's already bigger. They've had 400 million views, and it's just mm. growing all the time. But uh, I have uh, three grown sons, and, um, you know, they're all uh, lovers of God and, and active church people. And, and, uh, you know, they, they may not be as visible as Dallas and I are, but they're very proud of us. And and uh, it's a fun time. We have a great time at the family reunions. Uh, Dallas is getting recognized everywhere he goes, which is something I kind of avoided. I um, My grandkids, Dallas's kids said, uh, they said, Grandpa, when Left Behind was so, was so popular, uh, were you recognized everywhere? And I said, well, I was recognized just enough to make it fun and not so much that it became a nuisance. And they, and they, and they said, a nuisance? I think dad likes it. <laughs> but he's so good. He's so good with people. And and his deal is so much more visible that wherever we go, people want to have selfies taken with him. And you know, we, we took the kids to a, a gaming place where they have bowling and video games. And people there were rushing up saying, can I get a selfie with Dallas? You know, and I go, huh, I'm the dad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one thing I just wanted to ask you about trust in general, because the thing I've noticed with both you and Dallas, having interviewed you guys number a number of times over the years, is that both stories really seem to rely heavily on trust in God and what role that played just in your whole trajectory as well as Dallas's trajectory. Yeah, I think it's this acknowledgement of where your reader or viewer is coming from. And then, um, you know, if you're if you're a trustworthy person, I want to tell the truth. I want to be very careful with the truth. Now, that doesn't mean I won't speculate, as I've said. You know, we we imagine what things could have been like, but always want to do justice to the, to the truth. And uh, I remember I was interviewed on a lot of uh, general market uh, news shows back when Left Behind was so popular. And they, they always tried to get at the fact that aren't you being exclusivistic? Aren't you shutting everybody else out? Only you Christians get to go to heaven. Only the good people go. Only the bad people stay. And it was important for me to say, look, I know people who are not believers. And it breaks my heart to think they're not, they would be left behind because they're nicer than some believers I know. It isn't the best people or the good people that go. It's the true believers. It's the ones who realize what they need. And I'd like to think Dallas caught some of that. Um, we didn't talk about it so much overtly. I didn't know what he would do with his career. I, I knew fairly soon that he was going to be a filmmaker. But I, I like to think that that he caught some of that where you, you don't uh, act triumphant over some of the tough things in Scripture. They need to break your heart. And that's what that's what allows you to communicate with people. So, Jerry, as we round out to a close here, my final question for you, the book, The Chosen, Come and See is out right now. But what is coming next on your docket? Uh, I'm starting n number three, season three. So I've got those scripts. Uh, I usually like to, to do it after I've seen everything on the screen, but that takes so long. Uh, it, it takes too long to get the stuff out after that. So I'm, I'm starting to build book three um, on 
on the scripts I have already, and uh, it's really going to be something special. I mean, they've really done an outstanding job. Well, listen, Jerry, we so appreciate your time today. Thanks for coming on Faith versus Culture. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back with more of Faith versus Culture in just a moment. All right, we're back on Faith versus Culture. Dan Andros here, Billy Hallowell there. We just finished up a great conversation with author Jerry Jenkins. He doesn't really need much of an intro with Left Behind and now his son Dallas doing The Chosen. Just incredible family there. Um, but very fascinating conversation, really, just the wide range of stuff he's written about and people he's written about. Yeah, and the fact that he's trusted God and his son has trusted God in everything they've done. And when things haven't gone well, really going back to that trust and clearly mm -hmm. that's paid off really well for them. So it's a good it's a good reminder of the importance of trusting God and what path he has for us, because that family really more than any family around today has transformed the way we look at Christian media. Yeah, and I like that mentality of just obeying God. He said that a couple times, like just I was just obeying God. That was my goal. I think so many times we can all get carried away with our big and it's not bad to have dreams and trying to have goals and things like that. I'm not I'm not saying that. But generally speaking, if our primary focus, I'm going to obey God and where I think he wants me to be and uh, and then go from there and let let the results fall where they may. And God will use it how he's going to use it. That's a great mentality to have. And I think we can all learn something from that. So, all right, we'll uh, we'll be back to wrap it up on the other side of the break. This is Faith versus Culture. All right, that is all the time we have for this episode of Faith versus Culture. As always, thank you so much for being here. We'll be praying for you throughout your week, and we'll see you here next time. God bless. You.